welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from the cybernetic coven, currently developing Heat, the high excitement action tabletop, the one and only David Colby. No cheese jokes, they're way too cheesy. How are you doing today, man? Hello! I'm doing all right. Uh, it's really beautiful weather we got having. We got out here in California, and uh, uh, nothing's burst into flames today, so I'm a fan. <laughs> See, the joke is I've got a fan going, because it's... Like, it's beautiful, but it's still warm. You never explain you never... the joke. I, uh, unless explaining the joke is the joke. It is never the joke. Is, that is never the joke. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I This is my first time talking about heat on a podcast hmm. or hmm. a TV show or YouTube or anything, really. So, uh... That's surprising. So That's I just... Surprising. Well, to be fair, we only just started the Kickstarter. So, um, do you want to hear the basic premise? Um, yeah, let's get let's get into that. Is is he meant to be a um, meant to be a set, meant to be a settingless affair? Okay, so he is a diceless action focused role playing game. Um, which may sound insane because a lot of people think of action; they think you know. Uh, peril, risk, and risk means randomization. Randomization means dice. But um, don't worry, I've worked on that. Um, and it is uh, deliberately setting neutral. However, that doesn't mean that it's universal. It is specifically designed to play a fast-moving action-adventure game, usually with cool powers and fantastical gadgets. Now, that is a, that is um, specific. However, it also describes most video games, a bunch of movies, a lot of books, and a large number of TV shows if they had the budget. So while it's uh, specific, it is also extremely adaptable to a, a wide range of possible settings. Mm -hmm. Which I... I, but, which I that definitely def sounds like you're leaning a little bit into universalist, but not full universalist, a, a la GURPS. This is more universalist yeah. in the with it within a particular with a particular style. The way um, I guess I, I guess I could draw a comparison. I guess I could draw a parallel with Savage Worlds, which is technically a universalist game, but it has a particular style that it's trying to lean into. That being yeah. that, that being that more pulpy style, going all the way to that to its tagline, "Fast, Furious, Fun." Oh. I'm not saying it's a one for one here, but th but there's what my what my brother calls convergent creativity uh, at, in play, and oh. I will I will note that the the inv the invocation of video games. Makes me makes me laugh because it shows that I was right with something I said twenty years ago. Once again. Oh, what was it? Well, back then I was treated as a bit of a heretic by some folks in some of the tabletop scenes I was in. I think some of them still treat me as a heretic because of the fact that I was draw I was drawing from video games. I was drawing from manga, and so and so on. For the campaigns that I was running, you'd be like, "No," nope. uh, like, nope. and I was doing. I was using D and D, um, D and D three point five at the time for this. Um, three point oh and three point five. I they're a blur in my head. That's not the point. And I had said because a lot of people were like, "That you, that's not D and D if you do that." And I, I was like, "You're going to have a whole generation soon who did not grow up with." Tolkien, who did not grow up with Lieber, who did not grow up with Moorcock, as their introduction to fantasy. Maybe maybe they got into it through anime like the Slayers. Maybe they got into it through through certain um, through certain films. Maybe they got into it through the Hercules TV show. And they're and they're going to 
build up they're going to build off of what inspired them when they end up making games. Yep. And, In fact, and, uh the uh the 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 inspiration, the inciting incident of heat uh happened 3 years ago. Uh amazingly, I'm shocked at how fast time has flown mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. I was goofing around on Twitter because I had found a um, D20 hack for Mass Effect. And I was reading it, and I'm like, this is silly. The rules should work like how the guns work. And then I kind of worked out the basic math behind that, because if you've played Mass Effect, which Mm is plausible, um, in Mass Effect 1, specifically, um, the guns build up heat, and then they can overheat, which means you can't shoot anymore. So usually you build up until you're almost at heat. Then you use uh, your various powers, usually all of them, because uh, there was no inter-power cooldown in the first game. Uh, and uh, by the time you've done, you finished using your powers, your gun has cooled off so you can resume shooting. And there's this flow of combat. So that's where Heat's basic mechanic came from. Of um, You have skills. You compare the skills to difficulties. If the difficulty is too high, you take heat to equal the amount. Um, and difficulties increase with each action you take per round. Because, you know, I was starting off thinking, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm Commander Mass Effect, and I'm blaming the bad guys. Obviously, it gets harder and harder as you're building up heat and heat. And then you have a bunch of heat, and then you have a power. Power makes the heat go away bad guys get to act. And that's the basic loop that Heat then grew from. Mm -hmm. And um, so like the first, the very, very earliest version of Heat that I still have around somewhere is called Mass Effect Heat. Um, And it's, it's very different. There's a lot of mechanics that have changed over the years, but the basic system remains the same. Gain Heat, lose Heat, um bad guys act all that it's 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 how it works um and uh, it's been really fun watching it uh come more and more into focus because like i I think the 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 moment that he really went from oh this is kind of cool to wow i'm really excited about this is when my um compatriots at the cybernetic coven approached me about a year ago and were like hey we're going to try and publish a game. We want your game to be one of them. And I was like, okay, cool. That sounds fun. I hand it over to them. And uh, one of the members, uh, Lou, she takes it and she goes through and she makes a ton of edits that haven't changed the character of the game. They've just made it better in every single uh, tiny piece that I can think of. It all works together. Everything connects to one another, one another much better. The mechanics are much more easier to use. Um, one of the terms that she taught me was cognitive load, which is basically how much stuff you need to keep in your brain at any one time. Uh, cognitive load is basically why um, there are forever GMs and why there are um, groups that are constantly looking for GMs because a lot of games take a huge amount of cognitive load. Some people can deal with that and you know run a game, and others just can't. It's it's too difficult. There's too much numbers to track. There's too many uh, notes to keep. There's too many rules to remember. So that so they just don't. Which is that's not that's not a criticism. That's just you know this is how it is. But with Heat, we've tried to spread the cognitive load around as much as possible so that the whole table is working together to keep track of everything and keep all the plates spinning. Mm-hmm. I, can, so I can certainly get that. And it, cer- it certainly doesn't help that the game that, ever- that everybody thinks they have to play leans more into the, into the higher at- end of that um, pendulum on, co- on cognitive. Because a-, a lot of people a lot of people have this idea that that cognitive load concept, which, by the way, I'm, ste- I'm stealing that concept when I do future discussions. <laughs> um, oh, that's great. Um, it was invented by me, David Colby. Uh, just make sure you tell the people that. Uh, I, will ju- I will just say I'm not claiming, cre- oh, I'm not claiming credit because great artists steal. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people have, this, have had this idea that it is a black and white affair like there's a great wall of china between 
low cognitive load and high cognitive load, low crunch, high crunch, and the like. It's not it's not a on off switch. It's a pendulum, and whichever way you swing has its own price. Um, yeah. uh, I've seen I've seen plenty of people who play universalist games talk up about how how you can run anything with with them without noting the big old asterisk about how the GM is going to have to do extra work no matter what. Yeah. Uh, Which is uh, why uh, I designed Heat to have really simple GM rules. Mm -hmm. Like, um, bad guys in combat have been winnowed down to, like, two numbers max. Uh, It's not always two numbers. It It can be as high as five numbers. But, like, it's very, very, very simple Um, because at the end of the day, the bad guys aren't really, a lot of games fall into this trap where they mechanically complicate the villains almost as much as the player characters, which is great, except for the fact that, you know, each player character is played by a single person who's focusing all of their attention on this one character sheet. Well, the GM has to not just run every bad guy, they also have to run every non-player character um the under underlying physics of the universe like you know if a character says i shoot the sun they need to be able to go you can't shoot the sun or in some fun games they go well maybe he can shoot the sun um they have run all of (laughs) yeah (laughs) um which is why i uh cut down the cut down the npcs as much as possible um and uh, they're, they're still really fun to play because um, the way that they work, basically, is each NPC is a difficulty, which is basically how hard it is to do something to them. So if you want to, if they're a difficulty five enemy, if you want to sneak past them, difficulty five. If you want to punch them, difficulty five. If you want to talk them out of fighting, difficulty five. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I blatantly stole this from the cypher, cypher system. Thank you, Monty Cook. Um, but you can also attach characteristics. And characteristics have been a part of this game from the get-go because I love giant charts. Um, I'm pretty sure Lou has actively come to me on a Discord and been like, "Uh, David, why are you subjecting me to these horrible charts? And I'm just like, I like like big charts. I can't lie. Um, So the characteristic chart... (laughs) The the characteristic chart is basically uh, 0 to 10... And it's for, uh, let's see if I can remember from memory, it's uh, damage, durability, area, range, mass, people, uh, tools, and uh, reliability, which is also duration. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also bigness and smallness. Um, And they, uh, and so obviously like zero is human level. And then one is a little above human, two is very above human, three is more, more, and more, and more. And there's all these examples that I've written out. So, like, damage one is a sword. Damage two is a gun. Damage five is a fuel air explosive. Um, And so you can give non-player characters these characteristics. And you can also, as player characters, get these characteristics using gear or superpowers. And um, that's what's really interesting is because, for example, difficulty 10 enemy and a difficulty one enemy with a bunch of characteristics cost the same amount of points because the GM gets a a budget to spend on NPCs to run into for any combat situation. Mm -hmm. It's based Mm -hmm. off of the experience points. Um, uh, So those are the same costs, but they're very different because a difficulty 10 enemy is fundamentally more difficult to deal with, even though they're operating on a human level. So they're not... They're not being bolstered by these characteristics. Everything they do is within human norms. They just do it extremely well. Meanwhile, a difficulty one enemy with like nine damage represents like, I don't know, a, a, a normal guy with access to a thermal nuclear weapon. Like he's easy to take care of so long as he doesn't push the big red button, in which case you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And by trouble, we mean um, ship high in transit. Yeah, exactly. Um, So, uh, the other big important thing from that that is a part of the heat system are sparks. 
Um, fun fact, they used to be called Oomphs because, remember, this started as a Mass Effect game. And you remember how in Mass Effect, if you use the lift power on somebody and then you use the throw power on them, they, like, explode with this giant boom noise? Mm -hmm. That was Mass Effect 2, not 1, but, you know, whatever. Um, I, I named it after that because I'm like, that's the thing I want. Um, anyways, sparks are... Um, Okay, how to explain them? Uh, basically, when you succeed on a check, you create sparks. And those sparks are then the mechanical way of tracking your success and the narrative in the game. And most of the time, you don't really need to worry about them. Like, if you want to climb a wall, and the GM's like, okay, it's a difficulty three check to climb the wall, so you have athletics two, so you take one heat, you climb the wall. What's happening is you're creating a spark of climbing the wall, and that spark's effect is you climb the wall, but you don't need to track it. It just appears and goes and does its whole thing. Sparks are tracked when they're important and when they're numerous. So, for example, if you, say, have a piece of gear, like a gas grenade, that creates six smoke sparks that prevent enemies from seeing stuff, that becomes a, uh, a, uh, a token on the board with a D6 on it to indicate how many there are. And then those sparks will slowly decay over time, or they can be removed with skill checks. And this is called decaying or snuffing. Um, and uh, they will continually have a mechanical and narrative impact until they have decayed completely or until they are snuffed out. And whether they're snuffed out or whether they're decayed changes the narrative as well. Like it's different to have a, a, um, a smoke spark snuffed out because it means you're like, you're like waving it away. You're getting rid of it. You're, uh, you're, you're throwing the grenade in the water. So it's not spurting up smoke anymore, you know, different outcome. But if you just let it decay, then it just means you're waiting around until the, the smoke stops coming out of the grenade and then it blows away by itself. It's a subtle difference in this case, it gets more important when we're talking about things like hit sparks, which represent incoming damage. Like if a bad guy shoots at you with a gun, like blam, 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 and you've got a whole bunch of blam, 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 blam sparks on your head. If you snuff those out by, like, say, using finesse to dodge roll out of the way, well, then it means all those bullets missed. If you decay, if you let them decay then each hit spark will rack up heat on your character. And if your heat gets too high, you can get wounded. If it gets really, really high, you can get killed. Um, and that's one way that the system works. And see, the neat thing about this is this leads to situations where a character will act, you know, they'll take out some bad guys, they'll use a power, then the bad guys act, and they put their hit sparks onto this character who now has this ticking clock over their head that the other characters can get rid of using skill checks, which promotes cooperation, saving your friends, deciding exactly how you want to spend your turn. Because remember, every action you take adds plus one difficulty to the next action, which means that now we're getting the tension and the drama because you only have a limited amount of resources and you have like five things you want to do and you need to decide which one you want to do and which ones you don't do will then spin off new ramifications that the GM can then work into a continuing action-based story. Mm -hmm. See? It, it works. I would say it just works, but I don't... But, um... This isn't... this, But we don't need 50,000 mods to make it work. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's very moddable because, like, the rules are pretty simple. Um, in fact, that's part of the go uh, the the Kickstarter's goal is to kind of show off how moddable yeah. Heat is because our stretch goals are all um, but, new settings yeah. mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. in Heat. And I very cleverly uh, recruited all of my nerd friends to uh, be willing to write settings for Heat, assuming the money comes in. So I don't have to do extra work beyond, you know, helping them mechanicalize their setting ideas but you know that's easy it's 
It's actually um, half the reason why I I wanted to write a bunch of settings is just to show people like it's easy to make this stuff. I want people to get heat and go, oh, I can run this or I can run that or I can run this other thing and then have the tools to then take the mechanics and utilize them in a new way. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, tell me if I'm talking too much. No, no worries. We, we play this kind of thing by ear, <clears throat> here, here in the temple. But earlier you talked about checks, which I do think that should be clarified since you're, you've described Heat as a diceless game, which is <laughs> most cer which is most certainly a bold a bold move to take. I know I know some would say it would be a bold move to take nowadays, but no, regardless of era, it's a bold move to take because. The amount of diceless games that are in circulation are a significant minority, and the amount of, and the amount of ones that people are going to reference quite a bit is an even smaller one. The big one that gets referenced is Amber. So I'm I'm curious, what made you want to go in a diceless direction, and how do you have it work? Is it on a resource management approach, or do you have something else set up for your equivalent to checks? Okay, so. Um, the resource that you manage is heat. Every character can take six heat without worrying. No problems. Once you take seven to eight heat, you are lightly overheating. When you go from nine to ten heat, you're badly overheating. When you hit uh, eleven heat, you are wounded. When you hit twelve heat, you are heavily wounded. And if you hit thirteen heat, you are dead. Flat out. Now, the way you gain heat, as I said earlier, is if your skill, let's say athletics, your skill of athletics is two, and you want to climb a wall, and the GM says, okay, that's difficulty three. Well, two is one below three, so you can either fail the check and not climb the wall, or you can gain one heat and climb the wall. Now, as a note, you can uh, gain as much heat as you want, so, like, if it's difficulty 10, you can gain 8 heat to climb the wall, which would then lightly overheat you, which causes um, uh, basically light and heavy overheating mean you succeed, but you succeed and the situation gets more dangerous. Whilst the wounding events are the same thing. You succeed, but you succeeded at cost, like you got hurt, or you're in a precarious situation, or some of your gear got damaged. The These are some... The yeah. Oh, and uh, and of course, finally, of course, there's the, the the ultimate sacrifice, which is if something's so important that you absolutely have to succeed, and your heat is so high that you can't do it in another way, you can just die in the effort to succeed, which, which does lead to the potential silliness of like, oh, I'll take you know thirteen heat to succeed at this random task and drop dead in the middle of the game, which is an acceptable sacrifice for the much more interesting uh, dramatic possibilities. Yeah, I could I could um, see I could see that. Yeah. Now, you may be asking, how do you get rid of heat? Uh, because heat doesn't just go away. It you keep it tracked on your character sheet with a d6. Uh, I I'm I'm silly and I'm deeply amused by the fact that this game actually does require having a lot of dice. You just don't roll them. You use them to track heat and sparks. So um, you can lose heat in two ways out of combat and in two ways in combat. I say combat, but it, um, the system is flexible enough that it's basically any structured encounter. Mm -hmm. um, so out of combat, you can just take an hour to rest or a uh, appropriately long narrative chunk of time. You just take time off, you rest, you don't do anything. Now, this is a problem if, like, you're in a serious, dangerous situation where you can't just relax. The other way you can get rid of your heat is you can either overheat or you can fail. So this means that <laughs> this game works using the gambler's fallacy. Do you know what the gambler's fallacy is? I do, but for the sake of those listening, give me give me the skinny. All right. So the gambler's fallacy is that prior dice rolls will influence future dice rolls, and we've all had that time where we're playing D and D and we roll a nat one and we go ah. Oh. Then a part of our brain goes, but what that means? I've got the nat one out of my system, so my next dice roll has to be better. 
Now, of course, there's no law saying it has to be better. It can actually be just as bad because every single time you roll a d20, there's always a 5% chance you roll a nat 1. In heat, if you fail that difficulty 6 check because you're at 4 heat and you didn't want to overheat, your heat resets to 0, which means your next check, even that, even if that check is extremely difficult, you're probably going to be able to succeed because your heat's been cleared and you can raise your skills to the level required to succeed. Mean ameliorated by the fact that you now have a wide open possibility space. So like if you jump across a chasm and fail, oh, you fall down into the pit, but now your heat track is completely cleared for getting out of the pit. Or if you fail to sneak past the guards, oh, you got caught by all the guards, but now your heat is zero for when you're going to fight all the guards. It's a really fun system, and it feels <laughs> surprisingly good in play. Um, it feels good, makes your brain juice happy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, um, yeah, I could see. Oh, that. sorry. So, with that, in, with that in, with that in mind, oh. Given that, given the given the width of how the, of how this is going to work, uh, especially since you, especially since we're dealing with something that is system agnostic, I know that th with the characters you have um, four categories for close that are the standard categories: close combat, range combat, personal, and social. Uh, <clears throat> With the potential to to um ha to have such a wide variety of, for lack of a better term, skills, do you have so, do you, do you have plans in the book to put in some measure of guidance so that people know what would what would be considered too broad or not broad enough for backgrounds for skills and what and whatnot even for um traits. Uh yeah um. So traits are a little trickier because I basically designed them by ear. Um, I should probably write out my rationale for how to make traits because I do have some now that I've thought about it for a while. But for skills, it's pretty easy. Um, they should be relatively broad and interesting. Like uh, the pre-written skills for personal, you've got athletics, finesse, stealth, uh, resilience, and awareness. Like all the things that a body can do. Each one's pretty specific. They've all got um, an interesting difference. Like athletics, you're big and brawny. Uh, finesse, you're sleek and fast. Uh, awareness, you're perceptive and able to notice things. Uh, stealth, you're sneaky. And resilience, you're brawny and tough. Um, but for um, the more flexible skills, because you mentioned backgrounds, uh, so I might as well explain now. In Heat, uh, you have six points to spend on the four generic abilities of um, close combat, range combat, uh, personal, and social, because those seem like they're going to be applicable to basically every setting. Then you have four skill points to spend on the customizable skills. Uh, these can be either masteries or backgrounds. A mastery is a inherent superpower. So it's stuff like being a dragon, being a superhero, having raw magical powers, being a robot. Um, backgrounds are specialist skills and place in society. So they're things like... Um, being a member of the military, being a spaceship pilot, being a dragon hunter, uh, being a dragon rider, or um, anything else like that. Masteries, um, every subskill of a mastery is linked to a characteristic, and the level of that subskill is the level of the characteristic you have access to. So say you're a superhero, and uh, one of your subskills of your superhero mastery is super speed. Obviously, that would be linked to the speed characteristic, which means that if you have two points in superhero and you've unlocked the super speed subskill, 
The Super Speed Sub Skill is at level 2 now, which means you now have constant access to Speed 2 on the big characteristic chart, which I believe is roughly as fast as a car. Um, in fact, I... Oh yeah, I do have heat. And I have the I even have the heat document open to the big table. Yeah, speed two is a car. So um, masteries tend to be extremely powerful in their specific niche because, again, they, they give you access to characteristics, which are huge. Backgrounds, meanwhile, don't give you access to characteristics. However, they do influence your starting gear because at the beginning of the game, you get a pile of money to build gear with and every point in a background gives you uh, six more money to spend on your gear and furthermore in play if you want to buy anything new you use your background skill to do it um, and also background skills are also just a really good way to further define the setting like if you want uh, flying a spaceship to be easy as the GM what you do is you then just have the characters be able to fly spaceships using normal skills. Like if you want to dodge with a spaceship, you use finesse. If you want to use the scanners, you use awareness. If you want to fire the guns on the spaceship, you use your, your sniper rifle skill. Uh, because it's that's not what you're really um that's not what you really want the game to be about. You don't want to be about specialist spaceship piloting skills. But if you want flying a spaceship to be difficult, then you make the spacer background, which then has skills like spaceship piloting, spaceship engineering, astro navigation, which then can be used in these specialized circumstances. Because um, one of the things about heat is if you don't have the skill, uh, then you know you're, 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 you, you, the GM is allowed to say that a task or uh, action is not possible. Mm-hmm. Oh, also, another thing about backgrounds is they're a really fun way to have your character interface with the world. Like, um, let's say you're playing a paladin. So you've got a mastery of your paladin magic, which gives you your innate ability to smite evil and heal other people. But then you have your background for paladin, which includes things like a squire skill. What does having a squire skill mean? Well, it means that any time you would be like, I have my squire do something, the GM would then be able to say, like, okay, it'd be this hard, and you use your squire skill to use it, which means that narratively, you've got a squire um, that you can order around and use to create sparks, which, remember, are narrative control. So suddenly, you now have a buddy. And um, if you wanted to further mechanicalize this, you can tie it into traits or even into gear, because gear can represent everything from a sword to a small personal army to a spaceship. So, like, if you wanted to, you could have your squire be a skill to represent you how well you can direct your squire and a piece of gear representing the squire himself. And also, you can tie it into a trait, because one of the traits is dependent. So now you have an entire mechanical and narrative hook all built into this background based around having a squire. Mm -hmm. And it's not, and I don't need to worry about like um, action economy or having the difficulty of including this into combat because those points could have been spent elsewhere to like give you superpowers or to have a sword. They're all equally weighted in the balance of the game which means it's freed to do whatever you want in the narrative, which I think is really fun. Mm -hmm. So, with that in with that in mind, I'd let I don't. I am a bit cu I'm a bit curious on pow on powers since that's another thing that can be go that can go wide open if um if these if left unchecked. Do you right. have a, do you have a plan for guidance when it comes to powers so that somebody's power doesn't become too broad or too powerful for the tier that it's supposed to be? Okay, so masteries are the freeform powers. Mm -hmm. They are given hard sets by the characteristic limits. However, every character also has powers, which are a specific thing in this game. Uh, a power is a discrete ability. That's very effective. It's very um, useful 
because what it does is it has a vent score. So a uh, vent, because I, I came up with a vent because the original term of heat loss reduction was uh, too complicated and confusing. Vent indicates how much heat you get rid of. So if you have a power that's like vent for heat to do X, it means that if you have four heat, you lose all of it, the power happens, and then your turn ends. So um, I like to think of powers as like capstones to your, your string of actions. Um, and of course, if you reduce your vent, the power gets more powerful because you're losing less heat and therefore are in a more dangerous situation because you have less wiggle room for taking damage or for your next turn when you're taking actions. So uh, let's take a random power and break down how it works. Um, magic Missile. Vent 4 to 0. Effect. Vent 4 heat to deal 1 hit spark with a mass 1 characteristic to a target within range 2. Reduce vent by 1 to increase the number of missiles by 1. Increase the mass characteristic by 1 or increase the range by 1. So you can see there's wiggle room here. You can either fire more missiles, you can fire more damaging missiles, or you can fire longer ranged missiles. Um, and moreover, the missiles will have the characteristic, in fact, Im characteristic impact of mass, which means that they can move weight. So like if you wanted to use um, magic missile to blast away boulders, you can do so by increasing the mass to the boulder mass and then blah, blah, blah. Um, so in play, the way it would work is, you know, you got your sword and you take down one guy for one heat and you take down the next guy for two heat. Now you're at three heat. So you take down the next guy for three heat because, you know, it's plus one difficulty for each one. So you're at six heat now and there's one guy left. So you vent four heat, which puts you down to two, and you blast the last guy with magic missile and, you know, he's gone. Uh, and then your turn ends. And, uh, you know, that's <laughs> that's basically how combat would work. Uh, now, usually there's a lot more than four guys. So every time your turn ends with a power, um, a number of bad guys equal to the number of player characters or four, whichever is higher, um, gets to act. Mm -hmm. So the risk with powers is then a lot of bad guys get to act, which... Um, is actually why it's kind of useful to have trash mobs in this game, if you're the game master, uh, because then it lets people use powers without worrying so much, because it means, like, if four difficulty one mooks act, it's not really a big deal, versus, like, four difficulty ten super badasses all acting, because, you know, they're going to do a ton of damage. Um, so having the trash mobs means... You, um, as the GM, can kind of mod modulate how dangerous things are by having less dangerous characters act on Moss, which mm. I think is fun. Yeah. Now, whenever it comes to utilizing resources, a issue that can crop up is what I've nicknamed the rainy day paradox, or the ninety nine mega elixirs issue. Yep, I know that one. Oh. Um. Eh, you know, the whole, I can't use one of my 99 Mega Elixirs, what if I need it for later? He says while in the final boss of the campaign. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I think he manages to avoid that because the only resource that is, the only resource is heat. And you don't spend heat, you gain heat. It, it actually is a very simple but very important change in perspective like you're it's not like you have action points and then you're spending the action points to do things you have nothing and then you gain heat bit by bit by bit as you act and while it is bad to gain heat because it gets you closer and closer to overheating it's also kind of good because you need heat to vent to use your powers and your powers are extremely powerful like there's a power here that lets you uh, turn enemies into sheep um, who wouldn't want to use that? And that's how I hope we can short circuit the um, the the ninety nine health potions problem, because it's limitless. You're gaining it rather than spending it, and uh, when you do have it, you can spend it for good things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In one of the first things I noticed in playtesting is that um, the uh, aggressive powers 
didn't get used as much as I thought they would because I, I don't know why, honestly. I think people were just leery of um, heat, uh, of powers that uh, didn't vent all of their heat. So I kind of added uh, defensive powers, which vent between six to zero heat. So you can get rid of all of your heat using them. Now, they tend to be less impactful than the aggressive powers. Uh, like, for example, shield. It represents having a, a magical force field. All this does is vent, vent heat. It doesn't make sparks. It doesn't do anything else but vent heat because it just represents that you have a magical force field that keeps you protected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, though it does have an alternate use where if you vent zero heat, it lets you make permanent force fields for your friends so you can make cover for them, but that's that's unrelated. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this is it encourages people to use powers because they'll be able to zero out their heat, which makes them feel safer. And it's just more fun for the game master if people are using powers because it means more NPCs get to act and then the NPCs can cause mischievous problems, which, yeah, that's why we're all here. We're here to have the bad guys do villainy and then for us to bop them on the nose. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in with that in mind, you men you mentioned that you have some settings in in mind if you manage to if you manage to get across the finish line. Is the plan to is the plan to have a few gazetteer like like approaches of just a few pages each to give players and GMs an idea of of the kind of settings that he could do. So. The, there are three settings that I have made for Heat that are the first stretch goals. Each one is also linked to an advanced mechanic, because the Heat system is relatively simple, but I was heavily inspired by an old RPG that most people haven't heard of called Diaspora, uh, hard sci-fi role-playing in Fate. I've heard, of, and I've Dias heard of Diaspora. Yeah, it rules. So... Um, in that game, you've got the Fate system, and then you've got a bunch of mini-games that are spun off from the Fate system that are all complicated and specifically focused on one thing. And I was like, I want to do that for Heat. So Heat has three mini-game systems. You have advanced vehicles for if you want, like, complicated spaceships or sailing ships or castles, uh, anything where you want to really systematize having an interlocking network of components. Um, then you've got um, advanced combat for if you want to use a hex board, because, you know, hex boards are cool. Um, and then finally you have intrigues, which are basically um, a way to systematize complicated large-scale projects, like uh, spying on people, uh, diplomacy, large-scale social combat, uh, invading a planet, inv mm, excuse me, hiccup, invading a planet, or um, anything of that level of complexity. And each of those is also linked to a setting that kind of uh, showcases it. So for advanced combat, the uh, setting for it is Tank Quest. Uh, tank Quest is set in an alternate world where humanity invented the tank before they invented the wheel, thanks to a uh, magical crystal that allows them to project hard light holograms if they uh, carve it in the right shape. Mm -hmm. So they basically yeah. built big boxes that protected them from like giant eagles and stuff. And slowly over time, they refined the crystal process until they were able to make hard light tanks. And um, the, the basic idea is that they eventually built automatic tanks that could fight their wars for them. Uh, unfortunately, their tanks went crazy and they had to use a big device to shut all of the magical crystal down and the game takes place hundreds of years later with society having been rebuilt into a kind of peaceful pastoral utopia and all those old tanks have woken up again but their programming has reverted to where they are more like wild animals than tanks and um it turns out that ancient war crime programs are in effect so that if they ever target a child or someone who's not an adult, um, they fire stun bullets instead of real bullets, which means it's become an incredibly popular pastime for children to go out and befriend tanks and then fight the tanks in arenas. And then it, it, it became a, a tank Pokemon. So you go out, 
you capture a wild tank, you train the tank to be your friend, and then you fight other tanks in gym arenas to get badges and to become the very best, while trying to avoid the villainous Team Tank Fist, who want to steal all the tanks for their own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's and it's like you wanted to mix Pokemon and World of Tanks. Exactly. That is uh, exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I, it's, it's a weird setting. I really like it because it's so silly. Um, and also, uh, it shows off just how weird the advanced vehicle system can be because the advanced vehicle system is all about components interlocking. But the components in this case are tanks and components representing your relationship with the tank. So it's all about protecting your emotional connection to the tank and then using it to fight other tanks. And uh, there are mechanics for um, putting extra points into a, uh, into, a, into a component to make it work better, which means that, yes, if you love your M1 Sherman enough, it can shoot through the front armor of that tiger if, if you believe in the heart of the tank. <laughs> Well, have you ever heard heard the expression, there are no atheists in foxholes? Yeah. Oh, geez. So that's the first setting. Um, Then we got advanced combat, which um, that one's actually one of the simpler uh, advanced systems. It's basically how do you make a battle map using heat? Because heat can be played entirely in theater of the mind. Um, And uh, the way the battle map works is you do round robin uh, each player, the, the GM describes the scene, then each player draws in one part of the setting, like they put in the hills and the corridors and the forests and whatever, and then they get to put sparks on it representing difficult terrain, cover, red barrels to explode, that sort of thing. And then, once every player has gotten to contribute and the battle map is completed, the GM and the players alternate on placing player characters and NPCs with the GM having a veto vote on where the players get to place themselves. If it's too silly though, they are encouraged to, instead of vetoing it, instead of offering a skill check, like, you know, it'll be difficulty five to stealth into that position. And then once everyone's placed and the battle maps ready, combat begins. Um, I was basically inspired by the fact that I was playing Baldur's Gate three and I'm like, wow, Baldur's Gate 3 has amazing battle maps. It's incredibly unfair to demand Ted, who has a seven to nine day job every day of the week, to come up with battle maps this good by himself on Saturday afternoon before we play on Sunday. You know, like that's that's just an unfair amount of work. So spread the work around. Mm -hmm. Oh. I just, I just, you have no idea how many times I would just steal a map from any arena shooter that was playing around that time. <laughs> I mean, that's the other way to do it. That's really good. It's a great idea. And it works great. So um, the setting for advanced combat is Star Walkers, which is a um, space opera that is set a billion years in the future and uh, exists in a uh, vast hyperspace linkage called the chain. Uh, the way fast and light travel works in this is that you can either go, you can go up or you can go down. You can't go side to side. So you can go from earth to the next planet and then from the next planet to the third planet, then from the third planet to the fourth planet, but you can't go in any other direction. So you have to go up and down the chain. And, um, this chain has existed in this state for uncountable aeons and it is locked in a perpetual cycle of republic and hegemony, where the republic will rule in peace and prosperity, then it will fall, and an evil hegemony will take over, and then the resistance will rise up against it, and they'll overthrow it, and they'll build a republic, and then the cycle just repeats again and again and again, because Star Walkers, as you may have guessed from the title, is somewhat inspired by Star Wars. Specifically, it's Star Wars by way of Dark Souls. Um, because I'm also tapping into the whole cyclical nature of the Dark Souls style games. So in Star Walkers, you play as the either the uh, bold rebellion that's fighting against the hegemony, or as the member of the members of the Republic trying to preserve it in the face of encroaching mm-hmm. fascism or anything in between. And um, you travel from solar system to solar system. 
and uh, get into exciting space battles, which are then mapped on the hex grid. Um, another big part of the setting is uh, the concept of liminal knights, which are my riff on the Jedi. Um, the idea is that the chain was constructed millions and millions and millions of years ago by highly advanced singularity level intelligence supercomputers called the machines who basically figured out how to do FTL travel. They figured out how to do anti-gravity. They figured out how to do life extension and virtual reality and everything you could want. Uh, but then they left mysteriously. And now humanity and the various aliens we've met are basically scrabbling over the relics that they still can keep working. But periodically a machine will take an interest in an individual person and they will gift them with incredible powers. And then that person is a liminal knight. They're basically able to ask their super intelligent uh, space god to, uh, you know, hack into that computer, turn on that ancient machine, um, provide short-term probabilistic modeling of the future that comes to me as a prophetic vision. You know, um, force powers. And... Um, they're kind of like the movers and shakers because, you know, when liminal knights show up, uh, things are going to get crazy. Mm -hmm. That certainly fit, that certainly fits. Now, yeah. with the, with that set, with that set, um, what would you be shooting for as far as the page count of the project? Uh, so the core book, I actually have it right now, is precisely 100 pages. It's lean, mean, tough. Um, I'm not sure how it translates as page count, but I want each advanced system to be about 5,000 words of setting, maybe one to 2,000 words of um, mechanics, and that will probably come out to about... 30 or 40 pages, depending on how the formatting comes out and the font size and all that. I'm not an expert um, formatter. I'm not even the one who's formatting the books. That's being done by, um, I believe, uh, Jotan, uh, who's an abs absolutely great. They've done an amazing job on this game. I'm, I'm really happy. Um, so um, I'm pretty sure that the current plan is that the... Um, Expansions are going to be a splat book that will come with uh, either be released separately or come with the main game because we kind of want the main game to stand on its own and to be totally workable without anything else. And then the advanced stuff is just extra. Um, but also, I mentioned previously that other stretch goals include all my nerdy friends. Uh, I've got a collection of people from Erica Chappelle who made um, Flying Circus to um, Debbie LaCroix, who's a pretty famous author. Um, okay, she's not... She's famous to me, okay? <laughs> she's she's going to be very embarrassed when she hears this, and she'll say, I'm not famous, but I'll... No, she is famous. If um, not famous, then we'll make her infamous. Yeah! So, um, um, each of them will be writing a, uh, a, a setting that I'm going to aim for about 5,000 words each. Um, and, you know, if this... Kickstarter hits our goals, uh, hits the stretch goals, I mean, um, those will be also collected in their own book. And uh, that's the basic uh, premise. All right, I can, get, I can get that. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, per se, but a, brawl, a ballpark, essentially. I'm, I'm honestly not sure, but I'm pretty sure... Okay, I can't give you specifics because... Again, um, I'm just the guy who designed the game and wrote the game. Most of the editing and publishing stuff is being done by other people uh, who are much smarter than I am. But the big advantage of this Kickstarter is that Heat's done. Like, it's it's finished. It works. It's fantastic. I think there's, like, maybe one or two sentences that I kind of want to edit uh, that I still need to get around to. But, like, we could sell it now if we if we had the money to, like, finalize the art and um, ship at places. So that means that the release window is probably going to be pretty soon once the Kickstarter wraps. And that's kind of like what we've been trying to sell people with is like, you know, this isn't a speculative project. This isn't a give us your money and then we'll design the game. No, no the game's done. It works. It's great. We all love it. Um, 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it de how it develops along that. And I would recommend uh, down the road, e either as a blog post or something like that, consider showcasing how one could adapt certain characters in different media into the Heat system. Because I yeah. do, I do think that is one way that could be that you could bridge the gap. And I've mentioned this to other people, and I've done and I've done it myself. Oh, not that I'm putting myself on a pedestal or anything like that. It's just a very good way to showcase what can be done with a given system. I'm pretty sure that's one of our plans. Um, I'm on Twitter, and one of my favorite things is to talk about how to do things uh, from other games in Heat. But we are definitely going to work up a blog post on that too. Yeah, and I'm not talking. I'm not talking about how to do things from other games in the, in this system per se, but how to. Do, how to do um, how to do thing how to do things l like adapting this or that character? You meant you mentioned that one of the settings is drawing upon Star Wars. So, for ex for example, going into how one might ad might adapt a given character from Star Wars within the te within the um, sandbox of Heat. And I'm not saying so. No, let's go with, go with that. Just that's one p potential example. So, uh, one fun fact, um, I've actually recently finished a quick start adventure that I'm pretty sure we're going to be releasing soon. Uh, it's called Don't Tell Me the Odds, and it's actually set in Star Walkers because uh, it's the setting that I think is pretty apropos to the, to the, uh, to the current zeitgeist. Uh, furthermore, it comes with four pre-made characters, so you can see how to make certain archetypes uh, in Heat. Uh, one of them is a pretty clear uh, Ray. Um, uh, forgot her last name. Ray from Star Wars. Uh, our character. Oh yeah. Ray, um, oh yeah. Ray Pal. No. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, then then we also and then we also got a kind of a, a pseudo Chewbacca. We got a pseudo C three PO. Except you know they're much cooler because. I'm better at writing than George Lucas. You're also better at, you're probably also better at writing than J.J. Abrams, but that's not saying much. Yeah, it's true. Um, you're not better. You're. Anyway. you're it's, not, it's not saying much to say that someone's better than the man I've called the California role. <laughs> so, um, that, that, quick, that quick start is... I'm pretty proud of it. Um, I think it shows off Heat's flexibility really well. Like, for example... Um, Something I haven't mentioned so far: Heat's auto balancing. Um, if you are playing with one player character, it works the same as if you are playing with four player characters. Because the way the um, combat system works is, you set the XP you set the XP level, and then the player characters are multiplied into that, and that gives you a danger budget. And then you spend the danger budget on NPCs, so it automatically balances. And so, um, rather than encounters, the um, the pre-made will instead give you a setup for the situation, and then give you a buffet of pre-made NPCs and how they'll act and how they could act that you then get to uh, moderate and modulate for your player characters. Also, uh, there are horse-sized Dalmatians that you can ride and adjust. Yeah, as 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 one does because because um, whenever we whenever we have those sort of fantasy creatures, wh whether it be that or or small dragons or the like, something that's always frustrated me is I is we don't see we where's the jousting? I want to see. <laughs> I've I've joked for years that I wanted to see a lance charge on chocobos. Exactly, lances are fun and jousts are fun too. Hmm. Um, unless, unless you're playing that Joust arcade game, which is just torture. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I, uh, I was uh, I was born too late to play Joust, but I was born early enough to play Fallout One. Oh, then you're probably just the right age for Descent, which also which also is evil. Yeah, I played the shareware of Descent, and I never got anywhere in it. Well, that's that's because Descent Descent was clearly made by people who hate the, who um, <laughs> did not make it to be played by humans given, 
given some of the hit scan insanity in that. Um, yeah. Then again, then again, when I then again when I first got a hold of Doom, I was playing. I stupidly decided to um, pl- decided to start out on <laughs> on Nightmare. So what the hell do I know? Oops. Yeah, you want to do the uh, one right below Nightmare. You want the one that doesn't spawn enemies infinitely. Oh, uh, I made the same mistake when I first played Call of Duty, and I end up go I end up going with Veteran, and. You will hit. You will. Le- you will learn to hate grenades, through, pl- through playing <laughs> through playing certain cods on veteran, um, especially World at War, where where you run out of one, the range of one grenade and right into another, just as it's about to blow up. Yeah, I remember that. Oh. But and um, of, though my my brother my brother Zan was dumb enough to do a lasso run with Halo too, so. He's even worse. Last um, one familiar is legendary all skulls on. Yeah, I, I I I'm faintly aware, though I've never been a big Halo guy because I play uh, games on computers for adults. <laughs> ha. Sorry, I just I recent I recently got the uh, the uh, Halo Combat Evolved um, uh, remaster and. Uh, People tell me that shooting is really good if you're on a twin stick uh, on a console, um, but I play games with a mouse where you can aim, uh, and that shooting's terrible if you can aim. It's a, it's a complicated affair. That that's a whole other that's a whole other matter. But all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And oh, it's my pleasure. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Which is <laughs> a shame. I'm I'm really boring. I don't even like the taste of alcohol. Sorry. <laughs> and then this is your say anything about alcohol. Yeah, fair enough. All right, uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody. Bye.